people like Paul Finley, why, as I say, I put one of the 10 leading Americans of my time, Paul would not survive in today's Republican Party. He would be called a, what, a rhino, a Republican in name only. Uh, I view Paul as one of the finest men I ever knew in politics, and therefore uh, not necessarily a good politician, because to be politic is not to offend, and Paul didn't care if he said what he thought. Not all heroes are found on the battlefield. Some are found in the halls of Congress. This is the story of one such hero, a moderate Republican from Illinois who spoke out against segregation, the Vietnam War, and against powerful lobbyists. For 22 years, this country congressman had the courage to fight and battle for causes he believed in. This is the story of Paul Findlay, who had the courage to speak out. By 1969, public opinion hadn't shifted, but things like Paul did, courageous things, uh, which ran against the Republican Party in those days. Nixon had been elected in 68 with a plan to end the war, which turned out to be a plan really to quadruple the bombing and win the war. But uh, Paul had a lot of guts. Nixon's expansion of the war triggered a constitutional battle between Congress and the president. Paul would be at the center of that fight. The first evolution, I think, in his thinking was his belief that the House of Representatives had essentially abandoned its role in foreign affairs and foreign policy. And he worked to reassert that. And so that starts it, and then it ends up with the War Powers Act effectively uh, limiting what the President of the United States could do unilaterally in terms of military force abroad. But first, it was a reassertion of the House's authority. I think this was instead an assertion on the part of Congress of its own constitutional role in the field of war powers, a role that we've very uh, seriously neglected in recent years. For most of his time in Congress, Paul's foreign policy initiatives focused primarily on Europe. A trip to the Middle East changed all that. But in 1973, I received a letter from a woman in my home county, and she lamented the fact that her son, who had been teaching in Kuwait, had been arrested in South Yemen and charged with, with spying, with es espionage. Well, um, we had no diplomatic mission in South Yemen. We hadn't had any since 1967. If I were to try to get him out, as I finally concluded I had to, I would go by myself. My family approved, but reluctantly. And to my surprise, they really rolled out the carpet of welcome. They couldn't have been nicer to me. And the agenda the people in South Yemen had worked up for me dealt with the Middle East bias, favoring Israel, and against the legitimate interests of the Arab states. He began to speak out, issue commentaries, write letters to the president or the secretary of state or whoever. While Israel has rights that need to be recognized, uh, so do the Arabs. He was a great leader of our party in the Congress, uh, sometimes lonely in the sense uh, issues. He certainly paid the political price. I don't think he'd change a thing if he had to do over again. 